Kubernetes follows a SIG, or special interest group, model. And that's how Kubernetes development work is done, is through SIGs. There is a SIG for documentation, SIG docs. Uh, so when I do these presentations, I like to flip Q&A, and I like to take questions up front to ask specifically what it is that you are hoping to get from this talk so that I can address that as we move through the content. So just really quickly, uh, what are folks hoping to get from this presentation? I cannot promise satisfaction, possibly disappointment, but I will at least uh, address your concern. Yes, please. Excellent. Yes, I can talk. Uh, I will talk about uh, how we handle uh, workflows for change management with multilingual content. Uh, anyone else before I get rolling? Uh, callbacks for incomplete uh, transformation. Excellent. Yes, uh, I can also talk about that as well. Uh, that's that's built in really nicely to our static site generator. So I can be. Uh, I will be sure to cover that. All right. Uh, Let's see if I, it looks like I have to do this manually. Arrows, I think, will work. Oh, arrows very good. Uh, so we're going to talk about the tool chain and the workflow for Kubernetes documentation. Uh, these two links are going to be really helpful for exploring content around this presentation. Uh, the first URL here is for the actual documentation. This is the documentation landing page for Kubernetes. And this is the GitHub repository site. Everything that I'm going to talk about today, you can see either in action on the site or in, in code in our repository. Uh, let's also talk about what this presentation does not cover. Uh, this is not about Kubernetes functionality. If you came here learning, hoping to learn more about Kubernetes, sorry. Uh, that is a much different and much deeper set of talks. Uh, this is also not a presentation about how to localize documentation. Uh, from a tooling perspective, we're concerned about the output of the localization process. So we're not going to talk so much about how to localize documentation as uh, we're going to talk about what to do with the finished product. So I'm happy to say today that Kubernetes docs natively support multilingual content. This is amazing. Uh, this represents the ability to host multilingual content for Kubernetes docs represents a huge technical pivot uh, in less than a year. And it would have taken us even less time than that, but we made a lot of mistakes along the way. And I'm going to share some of those, hopefully, so you can avoid them if you're considering uh, hosting multilingual content. Uh, when we first opened Kubernetes documentation for multilingual content, we were simply not prepared for what that actually meant. Uh, none of us, none of the SIG chairs, none of our, of our uh, approvers had ever done an internationalization project before. We were all novices. So we were all inventing things, guessing at things, uh, making huge mistakes. Uh, when we first opened the content for multilingual, uh, the, when we first opened the site for multilingual content, our workflow was not scalable. Uh, we were suddenly flooded by a significantly greater number of pull requests for multilingual content, and it was full of Chinese content. None of us are fluent in Chinese. So we were receiving requests to approve PRs that we could not read. Uh, and as you can guess, requiring Requiring fluency for all reviewers across all languages supported is not a scalable solution for, whole, for uh, reviewing pull requests. So that was not scalable. Our tooling was incredibly fragile. Uh, we responded to the overload of pull requests. We said, ah, we can't possibly deal with this. We'd better put all of the different languages, each language, in its own repository. Uh, but we didn't create those new repositories by forking the existing one, which made upstream contributions impossible. Uh, so we did that wrong. Uh, and of course, that solution, creating different repos, one language per repo, that means uh, repo maintenance costs also scale. Uh, they go up 
and with fewer resources, with the same number of people to maintain those repositories. So that didn't scale well. Uh, and we still didn't answer the fundamental question of how we were going to publish multilingual content using Jekyll as a st static site generator. We hadn't answered the most important question. How do we actually publish this content? Uh, so who here uses Jekyll or has used Jekyll in the past? It's OK. I, I got over it, too. Uh, so some things to know about Jekyll. Uh, there are some plugins for Jekyll that support multilingual content, but they are incredibly brittle and they're very stale. At the time when we first looked about two years ago at Jekyll plugins, uh, the freshest, the, the most recently updated multilingual plugin for Jekyll content had been uh, two years old at that point. Uh, none of them had received updates in two years. So if we chose to continue using Jekyll, our tool chain was going to become increasingly brittle. Uh, but we also made good choices along the way. Uh, not just bad ones, good ones too. So as we looked at the increasing technical debt associated with trying to, to flog Jekyll into doing what we wanted it to do, we decided simply to change our static site generator. So we changed from Jekyll to Hugo. And Hugo is great for multilingual content. It's not perfect, but it's great. Uh, and it's also uh, really good for build times. Jekyll's an okay tool until you get about 100 pages on your site, and then Jekyll's build times start scaling incredibly. They, they, the build times for Jekyll start going up a lot. Uh, Hugo's great for build times as well. So we resolved some pretty significant pieces of technical debt by changing our static site generators. That was one of the better decisions that we made. Uh, and we also solved for the pieces of process fragility, where we were trying to do too many complex technical things with too many people, with multiple repos, trying to juggle all of that. Instead, we were able to consolidate all multilingual content into our single existing repo, and we were able to integrate, uh, we were able to answer some of the, the pieces of how do we approve pull requests for languages that we don't read. We were able to address that uh, with our CI, and specifically, uh, we'll get to this more uh, towards the end, but Kubernetes, the entire Kubernetes project, uses a custom CI called Prow. And Prow, of course, is in keeping with the, the nautical pilot theme of Kubernetes. But Prow is a custom CI uh, that's based on uh, some Chromium commands, if you are familiar with the Chromium project. Uh, it uses the concept of owner's files, specifically. And uh, Prow let us solve two of the most difficult pieces of process for multilingual content. Specifically, it let us set uh, subfolder level uh, owner and review permissions for multilingual content. And that means that Chinese localizers were able to create, review, and approve Chinese content. Uh, no, not content for other languages, but very specifically Chinese content. Same for English, uh, Japanese, Korean. Uh, so individual localization teams were able to review and approve their own. Oh, so sorry. The other problem with Google Docs. <laughs> Good. Uh, we were able to use our CI to uh, handle approval, approval permissions, and also um, some uh, sorting and filtering uh, pieces of the localization process that ended up being kind of thorny. Uh, we also made some good process choices. I would say that the best process choice that we made is when we went into this process, the chairs of SIG documentation thought, we have to solve this all ourselves. Uh, we ended up inviting the localization teams themselves to participate in our tooling challenges. And this may seem obvious to you, but it was not to us, uh, at least not initially. So inviting the uh, teams, the localization teams themselves, to participate in the tooling challenges made things much easier because all of a sudden we had a much deeper, a broader and deeper pool of technical knowledge for how to solve these problems. And that openness, that willingness to uh, treat localization teams not merely as stakeholders but as equal collaborators, that made a huge difference. Uh, and I would say that that is our absolutely best choice. Uh, but we didn't stop making choices. We didn't make a choice once and then stop. We kept making them over time. Uh, 
so uh, when we first started trying to figure out how to answer all of these questions, how to address all of these concerns, uh, Prow had not yet been implemented, and Hugo was still in its relative infancy. So we didn't just make a choice once and then stop and consider that choice done. We kept on asking ourselves, well, is this the best possible way to do things? And that led, over time, to reconsidering and looking at uh, better options as they evolved. And sometimes that kind of uh, willingness to revisit decisions ends up like sort of like cultural neurosis, like, ah, oh, we didn't make the right thing, and like, it ends up being sort of paralytic. But for us, it ended up being a very healthy thing, the, the willingness to constantly revisit and re-examine our decisions. Um, and so our decision-making remained open, and that was very helpful. Uh, so the two most difficult pieces uh, to solve in all of this were not the technical pieces. Funny enough, Hugo ended up being uh, remarkably helpful uh, for supporting native multilingual content. Uh, the, the two most difficult pieces to solve were CI-related, process-related, and that were permissions, review, uh, review permissions, like we talked about, and also sorting by language or filtering by language. Uh, and by permissions, I specifically mean the ability of localization teams to create, review, and merge their own content without requiring approval from non-fluent speakers. The nice thing about this is that this scales. Uh, using, uh, using Prow, every time that we add a localization team, we simply create uh, permissions uh, in uh, Prow for that localization team to handle uh, their own content. And that scales nicely. The team provides its own review. Uh, and by filtering, I mean specifically the ability to sort issues and pull requests by language. Uh, when you're looking at the, in GitHub, if you're looking at the list of pull requests for the repository and you can't sort it by language, it's a giant pain in the ass. Uh, so the ability to sort by language was very, very helpful. Uh, this process was not easy. Uh, one of the biggest headaches that we experienced was when we migrated the static site generator, uh, we broke a lot of things. And that's because Jekyll and Hugo used different markdown parsers, cram down for Jekyll and Black Friday for, uh, uh, for Hugo, respectively. And uh, they are differently strict. There are things that cram down says, no, you can't do that, or yeah, we'll give you a pass, that are very different from Black Friday. And so uh, it was not only a matter of uh, being differently strict, the parser being differently strict, uh, but it also exposed some lazy habits. Uh, so uh, some, of, some of the things that we should have been doing correctly all along came to light when they broke suddenly. Uh, so that was a difficult piece. Uh, I will also say that uh, we, while we love Hugo, it is not perfect. Uh, so with Jekyll, in order to, uh, when you create uh, a sitemap, let's call it a sitemap of uh, page ordering uh, with Jekyll, you have to, uh, Jekyll requires you to create a, a page map in a single YAML file, subcontent, I believe it's called subcontent.yaml, and you have to, that's where you specify page ordering for the site in Jekyll. In Hugo, you have to specify a page weight in the front matter of every individual markdown file. <laughs> it's awful, especially when you have a site with greater than 250 pages like we do. Uh, so it's not perfect. That's a work in progress. And given that Hugo just released, what, 0 0.54 this past weekend, uh, it's obviously still in development. But I encourage you to use it. It's really cool. Uh, but in the end, we achieved a scalable, sustainable workflow for multilingual documentation, and that's visible on our site today. So... Uh, Let's use the time remaining to cover a little bit of what our stack looks like. Um, we host all of our content uh, here in a GitHub repository, K website. It's a, an abbreviation that we use. K stands for Kubernetes. Kubernetes, github.com slash Kubernetes slash website, or K website. Uh, and our two CI pieces are Netlify, which we use for uh, preview builds and publishing, and Prow which is built out of this repo, k slash test infra, specifically the prow subdirectory. And that provides our CI for Kubernetes. And uh, these both use uh, GitHub webhooks to manage the CI for individual PRs. And the end result, when all of the approval conditions are met, ends up publishing to Kubernetes.io. 
So, uh, this is uh, a very tiny snapshot of what our branching strategy looks like in Git. Uh, this is a very uh, small piece of a much larger puzzle. So, uh, when you visit Kubernetes.io and you go to the main landing page, you are uh, seeing the master branch. Uh, we publish from master. Uh, and we have, uh, uh, what happens for master is that we have, uh, there's a branch, uh, release dash v1 dot whatever the current release is. Right now that's 1.13, so uh, release dash 1.13. And this is uh, the branch that uh, is most recent. And uh, there's, you see there's a point at which that development, this was the development branch, it merged to master, and we merged periodically into this branch from master. And then we have release dash 1.next. And in this case, uh, right now, it's release 1.14. So uh, we cut this branch from, uh, from master, and then uh, when we're ready to publish from this branch, uh, we'll cut, uh, I'm sorry, we'll merge from uh, master back into this branch, and this repeats itself. And the current release strategy for Kubernetes is um, current plus four, the current version plus the four previous versions. So repeat this four different times, and that's basically the branching strategy uh, for Kubernetes when you go to the site and experience that live. Uh, so let's talk about Netlify a little bit. So uh, Netlify, instead of it's not just one piece, uh, each one of these, master, uh, release one dot current, uh, current plus one, current plus two, three, four, uh, and uh, we use, we have, for the, the version upcoming, we also have what's a development branch. Release specifies a release that's actually out there in the world. Dev specifies uh, things that are coming up for the next branch. It's not yet visible or published on the website. Uh, so each one of these represents a Netlify deployment. So every time that you go to Kubernetes.io and you switch, use the, you use the version selector on the site to switch, you're actually not just switching a version, you're switching your deployment. You're switching uh, which uh, Netlify server that content's being published from. And uh, for multilingual content specifically, uh, our multilingual, our, our localization teams use a dev one dot version dash or yeah, dot uh, language. So for example, for Korean, uh, the, the Korean team is uh, really very, um, very strict and very scrupulous about uh, their involvement. Uh, so it's uh, dev dash one dot 14 dot uh, KO. Is KO is the, IE, the ISO 639-1 uh, two letter language code for Korean. So uh, each one of these teams has their own Netlify deployment so that they can get uh, PR, the build previews for their own language. Uh, let's see. Okay, so this is, uh, I mentioned the ability to set permissions. This is what, uh, this is what that uh, permission setting looks like in the repository. So you see here, this is the repository name and this is the, the content path uh, Hugo uses uh, content and then two-letter code for every single language that you want to publish in, in uh, internationalization. So English content is hosted in content slash en. And this is the owner's file for English. <coughs> and there are three things that I want to point out about this file. We have two permissions levels, and this is true for the Kubernetes project in general. We break uh, people who can review PRs and people who can merge PRs into two separate groups, reviewers and approvers. And these, this is obviously an alias. This is an alias that is specified, two different ones, sig-docs-en-reviews and dash owners. And all of these aliases are specified in a top level file called owners sub aliases. And uh, the reason why we maintain all aliases in a single top level file is so uh, that we don't have to go into each one of these files and update individual names every time one of their involvement or permissions changes. We, we, just, we manage that in one place. But this is the really interesting piece here, this piece called labels. And you see that there is this marker here, language slash en, and that matches here to this. So every time that a pull request includes a change to files that are under this, 
this subfolder here, any content, any English language content, automatically receives the language, uh, the English language applied to it as a label, as a repository label. So that makes it really easy to go through pull requests, and you can filter by language. And so this is uh, a filtered view of pull requests that have uh, English language content in it. And you can see that's also possible for Japanese, Korean, uh, Norwegian as a test language, and Chinese as well. So that's a little bit about what that looks like. Uh, it's really cool. It works. Uh, I don't know what to recommend. Uh, Prow works great for us, but implementing Prow in its entirety for another project may be difficult. So I give that as a content warning, but other than that, uh, that's how we do it, and it works really well. Thank you. We have three minutes for questions. Yes. Um, you'll make the slides available somewhere, right? They are already published on Penta, and they're available as a file attachment. Uh, that is an excellent question. They can, if it doesn't exist yet, if it hasn't, if the file itself has not been translated, they can simply go into content slash two letter, whatever it is, like say uh, Korean as an example, content slash KO, and they can look in the file, the subfolder tree, and see if that file exists yet as a Korean, uh, as a file in the Korean subtree. If it uh, doesn't exist yet, it hasn't been localized. Uh, and that's, so sir, to speak specifically to your question about how we handle fallbacks. Uh, it's possible in Hugo, in the uh, config.toml file, in the top level of the repository, to specify a fallback language. So uh, we, have, we set English as the fallback language. So if content doesn't exist for that language, uh, unless you specify a fallback, it'll 404. Uh, but we specify English as a fallback. So if, if they go to a page that has not yet been translated, it appears in English, and the, the version selector is nullified for that language for that page. Yes? Uh, so, uh, if you go to the Kubernetes homepage, and if you go to uh, docs slash contribute, uh, we have a localization guide, and I know that there, I can't remember whether we've published it there or in the, the repo wiki, but there is a script that you can run that can say, uh, has this content changed between versions? So there is, uh, <laughs> but for incomplete translation, uh, if that file exists, uh, that partial content will be published. There's nothing, uh, there's nothing that will uh, only publish, say, uh, the, the paragraphs that have been uh, completed. The entire file will be published, and it'll be mixed content. Great. Um, very useful. I'm actually in the middle of a big translation job myself, so it's very useful. Thank you very much. Absolutely, yeah. Thank you.